Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we are reflecting on Neville Goddard and the techniques that we've learned so far over the 350 lectures and many books that I've read on the channel. This lesson is that you can change your past. This is one of the greatest revelations that I learned from studying Neville Goddard and his techniques. As Neville says, do not waste one moment in regret, for to think feelingly of the mistakes of the past is to reinfect yourself. Turn from appearances and assume the feeling that would be yours were you already the one you wish to be. Reflecting on Neville Goddard's profound insights, we've come to understand that the tapestry of our reality is intricately woven from the threads of our thoughts, emotions, and beliefs. Life, much like a mirror, reflects the internal tumult or tranquility that characterizes your inner being onto the canvas you call your life. Neville suggested that rather than contesting what is seen in the mirror, which is common, we should focus on addressing the source of the reflection through introspection. To change your reality, it is essential to delve inward and initiate transformation at the foundation of your consciousness. To alter your reality, you must venture inward, initiating change at the very core of your consciousness. Take a moment to notice the numerous thoughts crossing your mind right now. You may come across thoughts related to the present moment, but most of them will be about the past. Your mind tends to replay past events with great intensity, which often leaves little room for the present or future. This is because the mind functions as a repository of the past. Cataloging experiences along with the resultant emotions and beliefs forged through these experiences. The archival function is crucial, aiding us in navigating life without falling prey to past follies. For instance, consider the profound impact of a painful lesson learned from a childhood burn. Such an experience, though seemingly small, embeds itself deeply within your psyche, serving as a potent cautionary tale. This burn, perhaps resulting from a moment of youthful curiosity, reaching out to touch a hot stove or the flicker of a candle flame, translates into a vivid memory charged with pain and surprise. The immediate physical pain of the burn is accompanied by an emotional realization. The world contains elements that can harm us if we're not careful. This lesson extends far beyond the initial incident. It imprints a cautionary blueprint in your mind, steering you away from similar harm in the future. The memory of the burn becomes a subconscious reminder of the importance of assessing risks and being mindful of your surroundings. This does not mean we live in fear, but rather with a heightened awareness of our actions and their potential consequences. Moreover, this childhood experience of a burn teaches you about resilience and recovery. The pain eventually subsides and the wound heals, showing you your body's remarkable ability to recover and adapt. This cycle of action, consequence, and recovery serves as a foundational lesson in cause and effect, shaping your approach to new experiences and challenges as you grow. Thus, a simple yet painful incident, like a childhood burn, encompasses a multitude of lessons, caution, awareness, resilience, and the natural laws of cause and effect. It underscores the complex way in which early experiences shape your understanding of the world and influence your behavior long into adulthood. However, this protective mechanism morphs into a double-edged sword when your perception of reality becomes so tinted by past experiences that you close yourself to new possibilities. Past heartbreaks, failures, or losses should not define your openness to love, success, or joy in the present and future. Yet the survival brain in its quest to shield you from pain often traps you in a loop of past memories, stifling growth and transformation. If you wish to master your destinies and craft your realities, 
you cannot afford to dwell incessantly in the past. Embracing beliefs anchored in past experiences only serves to recreate similar circumstances, contrary to the essence of reality creation. Given that time is an illusion with the past, present, and future existing simultaneously in the infinite now, the present moment stands as the fertile ground for creation. It is here, in the present, that we have the power to seed new emotions and forge a destiny anew. However, breaking free from the shackles of past thoughts and emotions is no simple feat. Your minds, having grown accustomed to familiar patterns of thinking, resist venturing into the unknown, preferring the comfort of the known however limiting it may be. Neville Goddard, with his mystic insight, recognized this human predicament. Your attachment to the past hinders your ability to envision and create a different future. Dr. Joe Dispenza elaborates on this phenomenon, illustrating how your bodies and minds become addicted to familiar emotions, trapping you in a cycle of negative thinking and feeling. He explains most people are constantly reaffirming their emotional states. So when it comes time to give up that emotion, they can say, I really want to do it. But their body and mind have memorized those emotional states so well that they cannot help but feel the same way again and again. The servant now has become the master and the person. All of a sudden, once they step into that unknown, they'd rather feel guilt and suffering because at least they can predict it. Being in the unknown is a scary place for most people because the unknown is uncertain. The reality creation equation states that our thoughts and emotions shape our mood and manifest as external circumstances. Thus, a persistent negative mood is likely to cultivate a life marred by negativity, reflecting the alignment between your inner and outer worlds. Neville Goddard's teachings often emphasize the transformative power of revision, a technique that allows you to alter your past in your mind thereby influencing your present and future. A particularly poignant application of this technique is in the realm of healing childhood experiences. Many of us carry wounds from childhoods that in reality or our perception lacked love, connection, and nurturing. By revisiting these memories with the intention of infusing them with the qualities they missed, we can significantly impact our current emotional well-being and relationships. Consider an individual, let's call her Emma, who reflects on her childhood as being devoid of warmth and affection. Her memories are colored by feelings of isolation and misunderstanding, which have cascaded into her adult life, shaping her self-esteem, her interactions with others, and her ability to form healthy relationships. Guided by Goddard's teachings, Emma embarks on a journey of revision, targeting these critical memories that have contributed to her sense of unworthiness and disconnection. Emma selects a particularly poignant memory, a birthday where she felt most alone, with no one to share in her joy or understand her desires. In the revision process, she closes her eyes and reimagines the scene, but this time she visualizes it infused with love and attention. In her revised memory, her friends and family gather around her, their faces alight with joy and affection. She hears their laughter feels the warmth of their hugs, and sees the genuine love in their eyes. They celebrate not just her birthday, but her acknowledging her worth, her desires, and her importance in their life. This act of revising her memory is not about denying the pain or pretending it never happened. Instead, it's a powerful exercise in reshaping your emotional landscape. By mentally altering the narrative of her past, she begins to shift her internal dialogue from one of lack and unworthiness to one of love and belonging. This shift does not occur overnight, but with consistent practice, Emma notices a gradual transformation in how she perceives herself and interacts with the world around her. The magic of this revision technique lies in its ability to rewrite the emotional scripts that have dictated your life. By changing the story of her childhood from one of neglect to one of nurturing, Emma not only heals old wounds, but also opens herself up to a present and future filled with deeper connections and self-love. Her relationships start to reflect this new narrative, becoming more profound and meaningful. 
You find yourself more open to love, better able to express her needs, and more resilient in the face of challenges. Dr. Dispenza's assertion that we often misremember our past, alongside research suggesting that our memories are malleable and influenced by our current emotional state, underscores the potential for revision as a transformative tool. This technique allows you to actively reshape your past, altering its influence on your present and future. Neville emphasizes the importance of forgiveness as a component of revision. Forgiving yourself, others, and the circumstances that caused you pain frees you from the chains of the past, enabling you to craft a new future. He asserts, revision is of greatest importance when the motive is to change oneself, when there is a sincere desire to be something different, when the longing is to awaken the ideal active spirit of forgiveness. Without imagination, man remains a being of sin. Man either goes forward to imagination or remains imprisoned in his senses. To go forward to imagination is to forgive. Forgiveness is the life of the imagination. The art of living is the art of forgiving. Forgiveness is in fact experiencing in imagination the revised version of the day. Experiencing in imagination what you wish you had experienced in the flesh. Every time one really forgives, that is every time one relives the event as it should have been lived, one is born again. Thus, to navigate towards the life you desire, you must first address and revise your past. Holding on to unresolved trauma from your past not only hinders your present, but also shapes your future in its image. The present moment offers you the canvas to create anew, to paint a masterpiece with the palette of your desires, dreams, and aspirations. Why then should you allow the past to dictate the strokes of your brush? Embracing forgiveness both of yourself and others marks the first step towards liberation from the past. Making the conscious decision to not let the past define your present and future is the essence of taking responsibility for your life. As we do so, the universe aligns providing you with the resources to excel and thrive. As you conclude this exploration of Neville Goddard's teachings on the power of revising the past and embracing forgiveness, we are reminded of the transformative potential that lies within each of us. Through conscious effort, we can transcend the limitations of our past experiences, opening the door to a future filled with infinite possibilities. Neville explains, it is a most healthy and productive exercise to daily relive the day as you wish you had lived it, revising the scenes to make them conform to your ideals. For instance, suppose today's mail brought disappointing news, revise the letter, mentally rewrite it and make it conform to the news you wish you had received. Then in imagination, read the revised letter over and over again. This is the essence of revision and revision results in repeal. The one requisite is to arouse your attention in a way and to such intensity that you become wholly absorbed in the revised action. You will experience an expansion and refinement of the senses by this imaginative exercise and eventually achieve vision. But always remember that the ultimate purpose of this exercise is to create in you the spirit of Jesus, which is continual forgiveness of sin. Remember, Neville's idea of sin is missing the mark not some biblical idea of immorality. It's saying if you want to hit 10 free throws and you hit nine, then you sinned. You missed your mark. You're always setting a goal for what you want to manifest. And when you miss your mark, then forgiveness of sin is key. Revision is of greatest importance when the motive is to change yourself. That's what he's saying. Father, forgive them is not the plea that comes once a year, but the opportunity that comes every day. The idea of forgiving is a daily possibility, and if it is sincerely done, it will lift man to higher and higher levels of being, Neville explains. He will experience a daily Easter, and Easter is the idea of rising transformed. And that should be almost a continuous process. Freedom and forgiveness are indissolubly linked. Not to forgive is to be at war with yourself, for you are freed according to your capacity to forgive. 
Forgiven you shall be forgiven, Luke 6, 37. Forgive not merely from a sense of duty or service, forgive because you want to. Thy ways are ways of pleasantness, and thy paths are peace, Proverbs 3, 17. You must take pleasure in revision, Neville explains. You can forgive others effectively only when you have a sincere desire to identify them with their ideal. Duty has no momentum. Forgiveness is a matter of deliberately withdrawing attention from the unrevised day and giving it full strength and joyously to the revised day. If a man begins to revise even a little of the vexations and troubles of the day, then he begins to work practically on himself. Every revision is a victory over himself and therefore a victory over his enemy. When man practices the art of forgiveness, of revision, however factual the scene on which sight when rests, he revises it with his imagination and gazes on one never before witnessed. The magnitude of the change which any act of revision involves makes such change appear wholly improbable to the realist, the unimaginative man, but the radical changes in the fortunes of the prodigal were all produced by a change of heart. The battle man fights is fought out in his own imagination. The man who does not revise the day has lost the vision of that life, into the likeness of which it is the true labor of the Spirit of Jesus to transform this life. All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, even so do ye to them, for this is the law, Matthew 7, 12. Here is the way an artist friend forgave herself and was set free from pain, annoyance, and unfriendliness, knowing that nothing but forgetfulness and forgiveness will bring us to new values. She cast herself upon her imagination and escaped from the prison of her senses. She wrote Neville this letter. Thursday, I taught all day in the art school. Only one small thing marred the day. Coming into my afternoon classroom, I discovered the janitor had left all the chairs on top of the desks after cleaning the floor. As I lifted a chair down, it slipped from my grasp and struck me a sharp blow on the instep of my right foot. I immediately examined my thoughts and found that I had criticized the man for not doing his job properly. Since he had lost his helper, I realized he probably felt he had done more than enough and it was an unwanted gift that had bounced and hit me on the foot. Looking down at my foot, I saw both my skin and nylons were intact, so forgot the whole thing. That night, after I had been working intensely for about three hours on drawing, I had decided to make myself a cup of coffee. To my utter amazement, I couldn't manage my right foot at all, and it was giving out great bumps of pain. I hopped over to a chair and took off my slipper to look at it. The entire foot was a strange purplish pink, swollen out of shape and red hot. I tried walking on it and found that it just flapped. I had no control over it whatsoever. It looked like one of two things, either I had cracked a bone when I dropped the chair on it, or something could be dislocated. No use speculating what it is, better get rid of it right away. So I became quiet, all ready to melt myself into light. To my complete bewilderment, my imagination refused to cooperate, it just said no, this sort of thing often happens when I am painting. I just started to argue why not. It just kept saying no, finally I gave up and said, you know I am in pain. I'm trying hard not to be frightened, but you're the boss. What do you want to do? The answer, go to bed and review the day's events. So I said, all right, but let me tell you, if my foot isn't perfect by tomorrow morning, you have only yourself to blame. After arranging the bedclothes so they didn't touch my foot, I started to review the day. It was slow going as I had difficulty keeping my attention away from my foot. I went through the whole day, saw nothing to add to the chair incident, but when I reached the early evening, I found myself coming face to face with a man who the past year had made a point of not speaking. The first time this happened, I thought he had grown deaf. I had known him since school days, but we had never done more than say hello and comment on the weather. Mutual friends assured me I had done nothing that he said he never liked me and finally decided it was not worthwhile speaking. I said, hi. He hadn't answered. I found that I thought, poor guy, what a horrid state to be in. I shall do something about this ridiculous state of affairs. So in my imagination, I stopped right there and redid the scene. I said, hi. He answered hi and smiled. I now thought of good old exes, ran the scene over a couple times and went on to the next incident and finished up the day. Now, do we do my foot or the concert? 
I had been melting and wrapping up a wonderful present of courage and success for a friend who was to make her debut following day, and I had been looking forward to giving it to her tonight. My imagination sounded a little bit solemn as it said, let us do the concert, it will be more fun. But first, couldn't we just take my perfectly good imagination foot out of this physical one before we start? I pleaded, by all means. That done, I had a lovely time at the concert and my friend got a tremendous ovation. By now I was very sleepy and fell asleep doing my project. The next morning as I was putting on my slipper, I suddenly had a quick memory picture of withdrawing a discolored and swollen foot from the same slipper. I took my foot out and looked at it. It was perfectly normal in every respect. There was a tiny pink spot on the instep where I had remembered I had hit it with the chair. What a vivid dream that was, I thought, and dressed. While waiting for my coffee, I wandered over to my drafting table and saw that all my brushes were lying helter-skelter and unwashed. Whatever possessed you to leave your brushes like that? Don't you remember? It was because of your foot. So it hadn't been a dream after all, but a beautiful healing. She had won by the art of revision, what she had never won by force. In heaven, the only art of living is forgetting and forgiving, especially to the female, Blake. We should take our life, not as it appears to be, but from the vision of this artist, from the vision of the world made perfect that is buried under all minds buried, and waiting for us to revise the day. A revision of the day and what she held to be so stubbornly real was no longer so to her and like a dream had quietly faded away. You can revise the day to please yourself and by experiencing in imagination the revised speech and actions not only modify the trend of your life story but turn all its discords into harmonies. The one who discovers The secret of revision cannot do otherwise than let himself be guided by love. Your effectiveness will increase with practice. Revision is the way by which right can find its appropriate mind. Resist not evil, for all passionate conflicts result in an interchange of characteristics. To know the truth, you must live the truth. And to live the truth, your interactions must match the actions of your fulfilled desire. Expectancy and desire must become one. As Neville explains, your outer world is only actualized inner movement. Through ignorance of the law of revision, those who take to warfare are perpetually defeated. Only concepts that idealize depict the truth. In his lecture, The Pruning Shears of Revision, Neville explains, And now you have a mission. You have a purpose in life. It's a noble purpose because you have been selected to really become the chief gardener in the garden of God. And in the garden, you must have pruning shears. And pruning shears is revision. You simply revise. And as you revise the day, you repeal the day. For the day is not slipping into the past. It does not recede as people think. It is always advancing into the future to confront you, either pruned or in some strange weed-like state. So it's entirely up to us. I hope that every man and woman here today will take me seriously and start this day pruning your garden, pruning your mind. We have numerous examples of Neville using revision in his lectures. For instance, in his lecture, All Things Exist, he explains that a friend recently wrote saying three weeks ago a friend called saying he was afraid he was going to be fired. I instantly revised his call. Hearing his voice bubbling with excitement, he told me that he had been praised for his work and I felt the thrill of rejoicing with him. Today he came to my office and said the very words I heard in my imagination. This morning while dressing I was thinking about an ad I was working on which carried the name of a very prominent man in San Francisco. As I ran the ad through my mind I said to myself, I want to put the word Mr. before his name. I did it and it felt right. I made a mental note to do it when I arrived at the office and promptly dropped the thought. That afternoon the man called asking that I insert Mr. before his name, not in the ad, but in a radio commercial where his name was used. Neville explains. Everyone in the world must be redeemed, and your individual life is the process by which this redemption is brought to pass. So we don't discard because the thing is unpleasant. We revise it. Revising it, we repeal it. And as we repeal it, it projects itself on the screen of space, bearing witness to the power within us, which is our wonderful human imagination. And I say human advisedly. Some would have me say the word divine. The very word itself means nothing to man. He has pushed it off from himself completely and divorced himself from the thing that he now bows before and calls by other names. 
Neville goes on to say, and may I tell you what happens to the man when he does it. First of all, he is already turned around within himself. He no longer sees the world in pure objectivity, but the whole world subjectively related to himself and hang it upon himself. As he lifts it up, do you know he blooms within himself? When this eye of mine was first opened, I beheld man as the prophet saw him. I saw him as a tree walking. Some were only like little antlers of a stag. Others were majestic in their foliage. And all that were really awake were in full bloom. These are the trees in the garden of God. As told us in the old ancient way of revision in the 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah, go and give beauty for ashes. Go and give joy for mourning. Give the spirit of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may become trees of righteousness, plantings to the glory of God. That is what every man must do. That's revision. I see ash when the business is gone. You can't redeem it. You can't lift it up. Conditions are bad and the thing has turned to ash. Put beauty in its place. See customers, healthy customers, healthy in finances, healthy in attitude towards you, healthy in every sense of the word. See them loving to shop with you if you are a shopkeeper. If you're a factory worker, don't see anything laying you off. Lift it up. Put beauty in the place of ash, for that would be ash if you were laid off with a family to feed. If someone is mourning, put joy in the place of mourning. If someone is heavy of spirit, put the spirit of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness. And as you do this and revise the day, you turn around and turning around, you turn up. And all the energies that went down when you were sound asleep and really blind now turn up and you become a tree of righteousness, a planting to the glory of God. For I have seen them walking this wonderful earth, which is really the garden. We have shut ourselves out by our concept of self and we have turned down. For the kingdom has come now, this day on earth. For as we awaken, we revise our day and we repeal our day and project a more beautiful picture under the screen of space. This concept of revision becomes so powerful that it fills your entire day. Any disagreement you have with somebody, maybe you have a disagreement with someone in your family, it ends up being a bitter fight. Walk away and revise that fight. Imagine the whole experience so it never happened. You get a speeding ticket. Immediately imagine that you didn't get that ticket, that they told you to go on ahead. Continue to imagine it. And in both cases, you will have something that will happen and the ticket will be canceled. Or the argument that you had with that person will just simply go away. It will be as if you never had an argument. One of my favorite stories from Neville is the woman who is somewhat blind in one eye because she had been in a car accident. She had been in a terrible accident and the window broke in her car and it shattered and some of the glass got into her eye. So what she did is she revised the car accident and imagined driving around the car and then continual going. She continued to have this revision where she would imagine driving up to the car and going around it and no accident happens. And slowly her eyes get better. She goes to the doctor and he's like, you got 2020 vision. It's very likely that she had retained that injury in her eye as a memory in her body from that accident. I have a very close friend that is somewhat blind in one eye and she had a childhood accident where she was playing and a hook got up into her eye and it looks healed. But the memory of this was so traumatic that she always has this vision problem in her eye. Then as she started to imagine this childhood incident differently, where it just misses and hits her cheek, then the eye starts to heal. I believe that this is a revolutionary way to heal. If you have something that's injured on your body, some sort of permanent injury, just experiment with that. I started experimenting with it when I was a kid. I was sliding down a, my swing set in the backyard and there was a screw hanging out on the pole and I just didn't notice and it just ripped a gash into my stomach. 
So I imagine that incident, I imagine myself as a kid playing on that swing set and sliding down the other side of the pole where there was no screw to rip into my gut. And as I did that, I started to notice that the scar was gone. What scars do you have that have impacted your life? Sometimes they're very profound. You're going to continue to live in the now, but your past is continually creating your present. Most of us are mired in our past. We identify with the past. That's who we are. I meet people that are not able to revise because they're so stuck in their trauma that if they forgot their trauma or they revise their trauma, it would make it so they don't know who they are or what they can do. They have identified with this trauma so much. It's almost like they enjoy the trauma because it's defining who they are. You can be so much more. So you must become aware of what parts of your life are being created from past events and simply revise them. You can change the past just as Neville taught us. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the reality revolution.